Welcome to our lecture online. Once they were able to predict or at least show the difference in the precessional speed of Mercury with and without the general theory of relativity, and once they were able to calculate and come up with the equation to find out what the time difference was at different locations depending upon the gravitational effect or the warping of space, then they began to realize, wait a minute, let's take a look at this equation. Is there ever a point where this quantity right here underneath the radical can become equal to 1, so that 1 minus 1 is 0, but in other words, that time would stand still. Is there such a place in the universe where this could happen? And that's when they began to theorize the concept of a black hole. If enough mass was pushed into a small enough volume, then there would be a region around it called the event horizon, and the event horizon would be at a distance called the Schwarzschild radius, where time would literally stand still and nothing could escape the gravitational pull of that entity, whatever that entity was. And so we called it a black hole since light could not escape from it. So essentially, if light could not escape from it, no light would come from that object, therefore they called it the black hole. Because if there's a complete absence of light, you can't see anything at all. All right, so that means that this quantity should equal 1. So then they went ahead and they tried to calculate that, assuming that the mass at the center, let's call that the mass of a single mass of the sun. So we say that m equals 1 times the mass of the sun. So for an example, if that object had a singularity, mass con concentrated in an extremely small volume, and if that mass was equal to the mass of a single sun, what would be the Schwarzschild radius? What would be the radius of that event horizon? And so then they said that would occur when you have 1 minus 1 being equal to 0. So that means that 2g times m divided by r times c squared would equal 1. Now if we put the r over here, that means that 2gm over c squared is equal to r. Or, turn the equation around, r is equal to 2gm over c squared and then they plug in the numbers. So that would be equal to 2 times g, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meter squared per kilogram squared, times the mass of the sun, which is 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, all divided by the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and we have to square that. And so that is equal to, and of course the radius would be in meters. So they grabbed their calculators. No, they didn't have calculators back then. So they had to do this by hand. Slide rule? I don't know. That, I don't think they had slide rules yet way back then. We had slide rules when I went to school because that's how I used it. I used one of those. That was a long time ago. <laughs> 2 times 6.67 e to the 11 minus times 2e to the 30th divided by 3e to the 8 squared equals, oh, I did something wrong. Let me try it again. 2 times 6.67e to the 11 minus times 2e to the 30th divided by 3e to the 8 squared equals. And the result was that the radius was 2,964 meters which is approximately equal to 3 kilometers, which is slightly less than 2 miles. Then, of course, if you double the mass, you would double the radius, and triple the mass, you would triple the radius. So now we realize that if there were such thing as black holes, depending upon how much mass was at the center, the Schwarzschild radius would grow, and the event horizon would go further and further out. So that's why if you have a black hole that contains a million solar masses, then the radius would be a million times this, three million kilometers or about two million miles. And that's where the concept came from, first of all, of the existence, the probable existence of black holes, and the size of that event horizon from within, nothing could escape. And this is how it came about from that equation that had been proven to be correct based upon the precession velocity of of Mercury and then using the equation to calculate the time effect of the gravitational force of something as powerful as a black hole and out came the Schwarzschild radius. Again, a brilliant insight 
to what might be. So that's where the prediction of black holes came from, all solely based on the concept of the general theory of relativity, and that is how it was done. I guess there's not, not enough material for a black hole keep swallowing up that it just keep gobbling up the entire galaxy? It could. It can get to the material, that's the problem. No, I mean, if it does, then... There's no question that a black hole could essentially, if for some reason the, the matter got close enough to the black hole, it would simply just go swallow it up. You just have to remember, galaxies are just absolute enormous in size, and black holes, even the huge black holes, are very tiny compared to this vast size of a, yeah, of a galaxy. Kind of not very big either. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, yeah, essentially not big, that's why. But then, of course, the area around the event horizon still has very powerful gravitational forces. It's just not big enough. Um, we know of some enormously big black holes. I know of one in M87 contains about 5 billion solar masses. 5 billion solar masses, that's the size of a small galaxy. So there's some very big black holes out there. It's not bigger than event horizon for that thing, right? Well, 5 billion times 2 is 10 billion miles in radius. That's sizable. That's bigger than our solar system. So we swallow the whole thing and then go around and swallow the next galaxy. Well, they don't travel around. That's <laughs> the thing you talked about the, um, the swirling and the swirling and the trolling and the No, it's not like little Pac Man going around eating everything up. Nothing like that. It would be quite something if it was, but nothing like that. Okay, that's the end of this series.